Hi friends, good morning and welcome to the Bible Project Daily Podcast. You join us today as we work together through the Gospel of Matthew, Season 3 of our journey through the entire Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Whether you're here for the very first time or you've been on this journey from the very beginning, I welcome you. And I trust that you're finding the experience of bringing the study of the Bible into the rhythm of your daily life, transforming as it is, I know, for many of us. If you are here for the first time, then why not click on the subscribe button and that way you'll never miss another single episode. Okay, people, I've called today's message, Beware of the Pharisees, and we're looking at the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 23. But before I actually read those verses for you, I'd just like to wonder if Pharisee is a word that you've heard before. I'm sure many of you had heard it before. And most people, when they hear that word, the first thing comes to their mind is usually negative. Because even in the secular world, that word has a negative connotation. But even most people who have heard the word only have a sort of vague idea about who these guys, the Pharisees, were, what they were all about, And why, particularly, did they have such a bad reputation? Who were the Pharisees? What did they teach? And what difference does it make today about these people who lived nearly 2,000 years ago? Well, the answer to that is plenty important. As a matter of fact, it might not be too much to say that there is potentially a little bit of Pharisee in all of us. But Jesus taught that we should beware of the Pharisees, meaning not only that we should be aware of them today, but also that we should be aware, in a sense, of Phariseeism. So we need to know what is that and what it is about and what Jesus is trying to warn us about. Well, I believe the answer to that is very clearly spelled out for us, perhaps spelled out for us more clearly than in any other passage in the Bible in the opening 12 verses of Matthew chapter 23, where it tells us this. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, people observe and do. But do not do according to their works. For they say, but do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves will not do as much to move them or take them off with their little fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make silacteries, which is a small leather box, by the way, put on the forehead. And they make them wide and they enlarge the borders of their garments. They love to sit in the best places at the feasts and the best seats in the synagogues. They love loud greetings in the streets and the marketplace and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, the Holy Spirit, and all of you are brothers and sisters. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father who is in heaven. And do not be called teacher, for there is but one teacher, the Christ. But he who is the greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So this paragraph, this short passage, is talking in some detail about this group of people called the Pharisees. And as I read it, I can see that it can easily basically be divided into two parts. In the first part of this passage, roughly the first seven verses, Jesus talks about who they are and what they do and reminds us not to do that. And in the second part of the passage, which goes through to verse 12, he tells us what we should in fact do and not do in the light of what the Pharisees did. In other words, what we should actually be doing in contrast to them. So with that in mind, let's look first at what they did and what we should not be doing. So firstly, Jesus speaks to the crowd and his disciples, of course, who are with them. And he says, these scribes, the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. So what does that mean? Now, that was an expression which meant they were holding the position as a teacher. In that day, the teacher sat in a raised chair and whoever they taught, everyone else sat on the floor around them. Now today, teachers and preachers, they mainly stand and do what they do. But in that day, the people sat and the teachers themselves sat just on a raised chair. 
And the fact that he says that they sit in Moses' seat indicates that they are the ones who are teaching the law of Moses. So the first things he says, that they are the ones who in that society have the authority to teach the law. But then he says, so whenever they tell you something directly from the law of Moses, then indeed that's something you should do. Now, at first, that can sound a little confusing based on what is coming next, because it sounds like he's saying whatever they say you should do. But what he's actually saying is that you should do it, not according to their example, you should do it, but according to what they say, because what they say is based upon the law of, of Moses. So when they are saying things based upon the law of Moses, that you should do it. But that becomes obvious that that's not, in fact, what they're doing, because in the very next verse, he turns around and says, they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them upon people. Now, this leads me to try and explain what these Pharisees were all about and what they were doing. The Pharisees were indeed the teachers of the Mosaic law. But bear in mind, this is what they did and what they had to say about that law of Moses. They said that, that Moses received the law from God. Good so far. And then Moses delivered it to Joshua. OK, but then Joshua gave it to the elders and the elders passed it down to the prophets and the prophets gave it to the men at that time of the great synagogue, which then led in another way is of saying that that carried on down the line and led to them as the scribes and Pharisees at the temple in Jerusalem. In other words, they're claiming to be the direct descendants spiritually of Moses, and they say that the law was passed down to them. Now, you might say so far so good, but that would only be the case if they were teaching exactly what Moses originally taught. But Jesus is saying the problem here is they've gone way beyond that and beyond what Moses says. They've taken the law of Moses, and as we know, and was in fact true, they added a whole lot of laws of their own. Now, their rationale to this was they were saying that the little laws, the lesser laws that they put around and in place, they acted like fences around and protected the big laws given to Moses. So if you obeyed their laws, you wouldn't be in danger of getting to the point where you'd break the big laws. But they kept adding law upon law upon law, adding all these kind of extra little things to the main law of Moses. By the time that Christ was living and walking the earth, they'd actually codified and written down those additional laws. And it took 50 volumes, 50 scrolls to write them all down. And each of those scrolls is about the size of one of the main books of our Old Testament Bible. Can you imagine trying to live a religious life by adhering to regulations that filled 50 volumes? It's almost unimaginable, isn't it? Now, when you looked at those laws, all the emphasis on them was on doing something. Some things that you had to do and some things that you were forbidden and must not do. It was all based on keeping the rules and regulations, all this external stuff. They put the emphasis on rituals and rites, regulations that you had to follow or things that you weren't allowed to do. But all of them were external things. Literally thousands upon thousands of rules and regulations which did nothing but place an intolerable, impossible burden on people. Someone once said that the test of any true faith is its action and does it raise people up or does it weigh them down? Does it bring joy or depression? Is an individual helped by the religious faith or in fact haunted by it? Does our faith carry us or do we strain under the attempt to carry it? And that's exactly what's going on here. And that's what Jesus is saying when he says the Pharisees are in fact teaching something that is just a heavy burden upon people. And also that they don't lift so much as a finger to help relieve the burden of the people. That burden who in fact they were the ones who put it there. This whole idea of being a Pharisee is about following lots of rules and regulations. And the key point is you had to keep those rules those regulations, if you wanted to have any hope of being considered right with God. But Jesus goes way beyond that, and he says, no, it's about your motives. He says, what they're doing isn't real. What they're doing is, in fact, just an attempt to be seen by other people as religious. They may be doing all this religious stuff. They may be keeping all these regulations. But what's really going on there is they just want to be seen by other people and thought of as special and holy. 
In other words, they're not really seeking the approval of God. They're just seeking the applause of people. Now, at this point, Jesus chooses to give us a number of specific illustrations of how this was working out. Now, one of them had to do with a little leathery box that they wore on their foreheads called a silactery, in which were placed four strips of paper with verses from the Old Testament, two from the book of Exodus and two from the book of Deuteronomy. What the Pharisees did was they took the idea of always calling the scriptures to mind and they externalized it to mean it was wearing those little boxes. But under the Pharisees, those boxes gradually over time became bigger and bigger. The Old Testament also talked about having a worn fringe in the bottom of the skirt, many believe referring to travelling and teaching over the years. But they had a great debate over how long those fringes should be, and they were designed as long coats, capes if you like, which had fringes already upon them. He uses another illustration. He says, these guys, they always want the best seats at the banquet and they want to have the best seats in the synagogue. And the best seat at the banquet, of course, was next to the host. The most honoured sat on the right or the left hand of the host. And another thing, he says, they want to be greeted in the streets with large cries of rabbi. And that word rabbi meant master or even my master. So in Jesus' days, those rabbis definitely thought that they were more important to the point that they were actually telling people they were more important than their own mothers or fathers. Their argument was that your parents, they just gave birth to your physical life, but through their teaching, you would gain spiritual life and that made them more important than even your parents. So when they went to the marketplace, they instructed people to call them rabbi or even father. Putting all of this together, it comes down to this thing called Phariseeism, which is a focus on the external outward religious acts, but importantly, activities designed really at heart just to impress other people. The key, as Jesus says, is they're doing all of this just to be seen by people. They're not really doing it for God. Jesus really must have thought that addressing this false perspective was rather important. He spends a lot of time teaching about it and against us. He started in the Sermon of the Mount and he does it regularly all the way through his public ministry. This was a major theme that Jesus kept coming back to over and over again. On another occasion, he said, remember, it's not what goes into a person that defiles them, it's what comes out. In other words, at that time, again, he was teaching what's in your heart will manifest itself in your external actions. Today, if you have this externalism without having the correct posture of heart, the correct internal attitudes, your motivation in reality is just about gaining the applause of people, wanting to look good. And that's what being a Pharisee is all about. And that is the critical component of what Jesus is teaching against here. He's saying if it's not coming from the heart, then that's a problem. And that's why he needs to address it. And one of the reasons he says that this is so detrimental to us is because it starts us down a path. One that becomes one activity on top of another. And the emphasis starts to fall on what you're doing, not who indeed you are. Now, I'm not for a minute suggesting you shouldn't do good things in service of the Lord. I'm simply saying when the emphasis is on the doing, it's wrong. The emphasis should be on the being. And if it's not on the being and becoming a disciple, then that by nature becomes a problem in itself. Jesus in this passage is saying, beware of the Pharisees. Beware of putting the emphasis on the external activities of religion. Because if you do that, it will just become an intolerable burden for you to bear. Matthew in chapter 11 reported for us Jesus saying, come unto me all of you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. He also said, lean on me for my burden is light. He specifically says here that the burden of the Pharisees is something that they're putting on people and it is a heavy burden. So when you chase around trying to do things to be noticed by other people, that increasingly becomes just a heavy burden for you to bear. And it's not what God wants for you at all. Religion can indeed become a burden for people, a pressure, a strain, a constant strain even. And that's what Jesus is warning and protecting us from. 
don't put the emphasis on the external stuff like the Pharisees. Instead, put the emphasis on having a loving relationship with the Lord and doing things just because you love him and you want to be like him. Now it is at this point Jesus tells us what we should do and what we should not do in response to this situation. Jesus also reminds us, do not get hung up on being called by some religious title. You've really only got one teacher and that's the Lord himself. In reality, in any church or even in an online community like this, there's really only one teacher and that is the Holy Spirit. The person who stands at the front or the person who is speaking into the mic like me, is really only a facilitator. The real teacher is the Holy Spirit. Don't think because you maybe get called teacher or pastor by some people, don't think for one minute that that means you're anything special or you're anything better than other people. In the end, we're still all brothers and sisters in the Lord. And Jesus is saying here, when it comes to spiritual things, make sure you don't get so high-minded that you don't forget that truth. He then gives another practical illustration in the next verse of how the contrast with the Pharisees should be applied. He says, don't let anyone on earth call you father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one there is only one teacher, the Christ. Now I am aware that there's a whole denomination where the leaders go by the name of father. And I've always been struck by this verse. In fact, when I grew up, most of my friends went to that type of church where they called the minister by that title. So how do we deal with this? How do we answer this? When Jesus appears to be saying, don't be called father. Now, I need to say that there's an emphasis that we need to have here. In fact, Paul was known to say to himself that he was a father spiritually to some other people in the fact that he had led them to Christ. He referred to Timothy as his son in the faith. So there is a sense in which if you lead people to Christ and if you're encouraging and discipling them, you are in a way a sort of spiritual father. But that's not quite the point Jesus is making here. What it is he's addressing here is not just the title. It's about an individual choosing to elevate themselves above other people and saying, I want you to call me father. I want you to give me these titles because I have a position that is higher and holier than you in the church. I have a position that is higher in the, the pecking order before God, if you like. And that's what Jesus is talking about here and warning against here. He says, do not desire to be called teacher. Do not be desired to be called father, for there is but one who is the real teacher, and that is the Holy Spirit. So he's making the point that we shouldn't be seeking status in our approach to service or attitude in living the Christian life. Ultimately, none of these titles or these positions will matter because all that's important in reality is our relationship with the Lord and is it one of love and devotion and do we do things because we love God and we want to serve him? Okay, the last point he makes in this passage is he says in the closing verses and he says the one in fact who is greatest among you is the one who will be servant. So we need to hang here for a moment because this is important. There are two main points in this passage. One is what the Pharisees did, putting the emphasis on external acts for the approval of people and how that just becomes a burden on the people. And now we're in the second part of the passage where he said things like, don't see titles. God is your only father. God's your only teacher. You don't need to raise people up or you must not try and raise yourself up in that way if you're called to those roles. And he climaxes if you like this teaching by saying is your attitude has to be the attitude of a servant the greatest amongst you should be the one who is the servant and those people who try and exalt themselves they will in fact be humbled and the humbled will be exalted turns everything on its head doesn't it so jesus is teaching that you need to take an attitude of becoming a servant in everything you approach in reference to your christian life and don't try and exalt yourself, raise yourself up above other people. Because he reminds us here, that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing. Be satisfied by simply being and becoming a humble servant of the Lord and of others. You will not ever get to be great in the eyes of God by seeking some position or some title or even power and authority. You get to be great in God by just wanting to be in the service of God. 
the people who are proud, the people who want the position and the titles and want the applause of people, they don't get anything in the end. You know, this perspective is at the heart and core of everything that Jesus taught about religion, about the spiritual life. The better way to describe it is everything that he taught about what we today call Christianity. And anything else was just a poor Im imitation. Or worse than that, it was a trap. What we do has got to come from the heart and it's got to be done for God, for only in a sense be seen by him. If you do any of these things wanting credit from people, then you've already fallen into the trap of the Pharisees already. I'm not saying that all recognition that's given people is wrong. I'm saying that if you set your heart upon gaining recognition, then you've already fallen into the trap of the enemy. I believe all of us, including me, need to walk away from this teaching with a new resolve to say, I just want to be a humble servant of the Lord. What I do, I do for the Lord's sake. Whether I get rewarded down here is not important or the point. I'm just happy to be rewarded by the Lord one day in the future. You see, our object is not behaviour. I know that sounds odd, but our object is not to change other people's behaviour. Now bear with me. It seems to me a lot of the time Christian preachers and Christian churches are just spending their time trying to get people to change their behaviour. But listen carefully, friends. The object is not behavioural. As a matter of fact, if you make it behavioural, the result will be hopeless legalism, conformity, and then you and other people will just begin to try and live your lives to conform to what everybody else thinks. And all of that will just become a heavy burden for you. Too heavy a burden for people to bear, in fact. So what is the objective? What is the aim? And the answer Jesus teaches here, the aim is internal transformation. If you're transformed on the inside, then your heart and your mind and your emotions and your soul, they will be where they ought to be. And you know what? The behavior will then take care of itself. If your heart and emotions and mind and your choices are pointed in the right direction, if you have the correct posture of heart, then the issues in your life will begin to take care of themselves. There's no point, I believe, in preaching at people and browbeating people on conforming to external religious activities, because none of that is going to make any difference in their or your position before God. What this always has come down to is the simple fact that God wants your heart, and that's the issue here. It's about humility instead of pride, simply wanting to serve others, in your world, there are people who desire to be king, but in God's kingdom, he is the only king and everybody else should just be satisfied with being a servant. The greatest, Jesus said, are those who serve and service will always arise out of a posture of humility, never pride. So this comes down to, are you just trying to look good in your religious life? Well, how about changing that for instead trying to aim to being good and clean and pure on the inside? And then you would be able to look God straight in the face and then he would be able to see what was really important to you. Hello again. I'd like to begin today by just asking you a question. If I were to ask you to list some of the characteristics of God, the attributes of God, I suspect that most of you might start with a list of things like maybe God is holy, or God is loving, or God is just. How about God is merciful? Indeed, all of those are correct, and they are, in fact, direct quotations from Scripture. But there are some other attributes of God, some that don't get as much attention as those. For example, the Scriptures clearly teach that God is, of all things, patient. I wonder if any of you thought of that one. Is that one of the thoughts that jumped into your mind? Well, that's what we're going to look at today and what it means by that statement. And I want to look at it by looking in this passage. Now, though it doesn't directly use the word patience, it does definitely illustrate the fact that God is indeed patient. You might say immeasurably patient. But there are also some other good things illustrated in this passage about God, more than just his patience. And all these things, I believe, we can discover are extremely important to us as individuals if we understand them and apply what they mean. 
As a matter of fact, some of the principles in this passage could affect the decisions that you're going to make today and certainly ought to affect the decisions that you're going to make throughout your entire life in the future. So, this is good stuff and with that in mind, turn with me and I'll begin by reading to you the whole passage contained in Matthew 23 verses 34 to 39. And remember, this is Jesus speaking and he says, Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will whip in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. And upon you will come all righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Baruchai, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who killed the prophet and stoned those who were sent to her. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you are not willing. And see, your house is left to you now desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the overall main subject of this passage is actually, you can see, talking about the judgment of God. In the opening verses, it talks about the fact that God has been patient in holding back on that judgment. But then the Lord talks about the reason for the judgments. And he then concludes by giving some hints about the time when this judgment will come. So starting at the opening verse again, it's important to notice that he says, you will kill. It's important to notice that he's not just talking about at this point, the messengers who were sent to Israel in the past in the Old Testament. He's also talking about the messengers that God has sent to them today and from this point forward. He is saying that he's, he did send and he's going to send prophets, wise men and scribes. But they're going to do what they always do. Is they're going to kill them, crucify them. Some of them they'll whip and scourge in the synagogue and persecute them and run them from town to town and city to city. And what Jesus is predicting here, some would say and recognise that this is fulfilled. We see it fulfilled in the book of Acts. We see several people killed there and martyred. And the book of Acts contains those stories. Stephen was the first to be martyred, but others sadly will follow. And we also know in the book of James, uh, because he mentions greatly the persecution. And certainly we know about the Apostle Paul, both writes to persecuted churches and describes how he himself was persecuted, as well as others around him. It even mentions that some will be crucified, just like the Lord himself. And in fact, tradition tells us that some of the followers of Jesus, including his initial disciples, were indeed crucified. In fact, tradition tells us that Peter was among those who were crucified. It even says that he considered himself not to be worthy to be crucified in the same way as the Lord, so he requested to be crucified upside down. So Jesus is saying, God has and is still sending messages to you and you are still the people who react by persecuting, scourging, killing and even crucifying those he sends. And then he says this in verse 35, And upon you will come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel, so that's right back at the beginning of the Old Testament, to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechah, which is from the end of the Old Testament, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. So what he's pointing out here is that this is a type of behaviour that has been part of the whole history of Israel, that of persecuting and killing the messengers that God sends to them. So what Jesus is saying in this verse is that this has been part of your history from the very beginning of the Old Testament. This has been part of the history of the nation of Israel, to take God's messengers and reject them, not to listen to them, and worse yet, persecute them, shed their blood, even kill them. Now, as we look at what the Lord says in these verses, the word patience not mentioned, but you can't help but read it and see within these verses the absolute perfect illustration of God's patience in holding back on his judgment. For hundreds, nay, for thousands of years, people have been killing his messengers, 
Egypt. And yet God still says in these verses, you know what, I'm going to send you more. I'm going to give you more opportunities. However, remember the fact that God remained patient. We saw that right from the beginning when when he spoke to Noah about the judgment and the flood, he actually told Noah he would delay it for over a hundred years. He also, if you think about when he spoke to Abraham, he told him he was going to give him the land, but he said the cup of wrath of the Ammonites would not be full for another 400 years. And Nahum the prophet reminded us that the Lord is slow to anger. And the Apostle Peter in the New Testament said God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. So as I look at all these verses, I can say categorically that God has always been in the history of Israel incredibly, unbelievably patient. One after another, people had been sent by God and one after another, they'd been persecuted and killed. And it seems to me that Jesus is reminding us here and those people he's speaking to in that day that God has been incredibly patient. But there is still the hint given that there will be a limit to God's patience. He's really reminding us and them that judgment is going to come one day. He may give us a few more opportunities to change our way, but judgment will eventually, of course, come. In other words, God's patience has a limit. God's patience will run out, so to speak. And when that happens, the judgment of God will indeed fall. Like with Noah, God will delay the judgment, but also like he told Noah, my spirit which shall not strive with men forever. That was Genesis 6.3. God also told Abraham that he would give him the land, but that the cup of the Canaanites was not full, but there would come a day when he would tarry no more, and when he did, and when that happened, the judgment of God would fall. Peter writing says this, the Lord is patient in his promises, but his long suffering towards us is because he does not wish that any should perish, but rather he wishes that we might all come to repent. And then Peter adds to this, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. In other words, many times in the history of God's salvation plan has God remain patient but then some sadly have made the assumption that there's no limit to the patience of God but of course God's patience being rooted in justice will have to reach a limit and when it does then that ultimate judgment of God must fall so the first part of this passage is actually talking about judgment but it emphasizes the fact that God has been unbelievably patient in delaying that judgment now, sometimes I'm sure, like me, you look around and you look at the world and you sometimes can't help but ask, I wonder where and when the judgment of God will fall in this situation. Well, the short answer to that is, it is our job just to recognise that God is incredibly gracious and patient. God is incredibly patient in giving everyone a lot of time, enough time, a full amount of time needed to come to themselves, to come to their senses, to come to recognise their true fallen nature and the mistakes that they've made in order that they might turn towards him, to give them enough time to turn their lives around, repenting, the Bible calls it. And Jesus here in this passage moves from stating the fact that yes, God is patient to the other fact that one day there will indeed be a judgment. And then he moves into the second part of the passage, uh, the reason for the judgment. And he tells us that these things will fall upon this generation. These are the ones he's speaking to because he says, you are not willing to recognize that God has been patient that, and that you still continued to kill and persecute God's prophet. In other words, the big picture here is he's saying, you're in the family line of all those people who've stoned people in God's name before. And yet, throughout that, all God was wanting to do, and by revealing his truth for you, was wanting to gather his children together, in a sense, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing for protection. And that's what he offered. But what did that generation do with that? The same as the previous generations had done. They were not willing to listen and to allow that to happen. 
Now remember, Jesus just had this conversation on this day to those scribes and those Pharisees. And he's just listed the seven woes, as we call them, to the scribes and Pharisees and saying, woe to you hypocrites. He's done that seven times. Seven times he's given them an opportunity to respond, to recognize their shortcomings, to respond and to change their ways. But now in this conversation, he's not just talking to those leaders. He's talking in a more general way to the crowd, to the people of Jerusalem. So when he cries out, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, it means that he's now talking, I would say, not just to that crowd in that city, but in a sense, in a spiritual sense, to the whole nation of Israel. He's talking about the fact of what God wanted and desired for Israel. How often, like a hen, I wanted to gather you in his little chicks and put you under my protection, God says. But the critical statement is that he also says, but you were not willing to let me do that. You did not hear me. You did not believe in me. You were not willing to come under my protection. And it is only for that reason that you need to understand that the judgment is now coming. It's going to come soon. So in the earlier passage, he warned that eventually judgment would come, said, I've been patient, and, but God is saying, you know, one day my patience will be exhausted and then judgment is come. It must surely come. He actually adds in verse 36 and 37 that that judgment is coming soon, but only again, as I say, because you've not been willing to hear and heed what he said. You see, the ultimate reason that the judgment of God will one day fall is because at the end of the day, people are just not willing to listen to him, even though he's been immeasurably patient. We abuse God's patience when we continue to ignore him by repeatedly sinning. We sometimes, it has to be said if we're honest, people even use the patience of God to allow themselves to sin all the more, to explore greater degrees of sin, and by doing so they simply abuse that grace and patience of God but he is slow to anger but yet when the judgment falls he will swiftly execute his perfect judgment and justice the teaching is here and has always been here for those who choose to listen or for those who choose to see it God was patient with Israel and he is being patient with that nation on that day and he is patient with our nations today but also he is patient, thank God, with each and every one of us as individuals. Just think about it. He was incredibly patient with you because he still offered you himself and his son and his perfect sal salvation, even when you neither knew or cared about him, because he did not wish any of us to be lost from him. Sitting behind the patience of God, we need to recognize there is a sober reminder that one day ultimately his judgment against sin must and will fall. But here in this situation, he concludes the passage by talking about the future time of judgments by, of coming. And he says to the people of Jerusalem, see your house is left desolate. Now many people read this and see this as an obvious reference to the temple and its destruction and he's addressing the people of Jerusalem on that day and he's saying part of that judgment that's going to fall on you is that you're going to be left desolate and by that I think he's pointing out that he means at some point they're going to be left to the consequences of their own actions left to their own devices so to speak to the point where God says this will happen and then when it's happened, you won't see me again until, along with all the other nations, you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's an incredible statement. He first says, your house is going to be desolated and you're going to be deserted by God. But then he turns around in God and says, you'll not see me. But he doesn't say, you'll never see me. He says, you'll not see me until you see me again. When you say, along with others, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, this is a reference to Psalm 118, verse 26. And do you remember, it was sung just a few days earlier when Jesus entered Jerusalem. They sang it to him and for him. And now he's leaving Jerusalem and quoting that exact same Psalm and verse back to them. So he's saying, on one hand, the time of judgment is now. 
But on the other hand, even in that, I'm still going to come back one day. And when I do, there will be the opportunity for you to say, along with the saved and redeemed, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So in verse 38, he's talking about the coming destruction of Jerusalem for that generation. But in verse 39, he's talking about the second coming of the Lord, his returning as Messiah in kingly glory, at which time all Israel will be able to recognize that he is indeed and was the Messiah. So again, this is a demonstration of God's patience and faithfulness because he promised Israel that he would not forsake them eternally, And so that even in the midst of this declaration of judgment, he reminds them that he will still be coming back one day. This is a reminder that the situation of desolation, even for them, is going to be temporary and not potentially eternal. I'm reminded of that statement in Habakkuk when he cried out to the Lord, In your wrath, remember mercy. And God, I believe, is doing just that here. God is pronouncing his forthcoming judgment, but he still promises the promise to Israel and says that it stays in place because I will be back to fulfill that promise in its entirety. I think this actually teaching and perspective is picked up by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9 through 11, particularly chapter 11, where he talks at length about the fact that Israel will indeed eventually be saved, but when the Lord comes back. So the Lord is going to judge at that time and for this generation now. Yet in the middle of declaring that, he says, I'm still going to be faithful to my promise that I will never forsake Israel for forever. Now for that generation he's speaking to at that time, living during the lifetime of Jesus Christ here in his first incarnation, I, along with others, believe it's fulfilled in the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem just a few years later. So this clearly applies to that generation of Israelites that lived in the first century, primarily in Jerusalem. But yet we will see in the second coming that many, many people of Jewish heritage will come into the kingdom of God, particularly in the latter days. But beyond all that, I think this passage also teaches and contains some fundamental principles that every one of us should apply into our lives today. In my opinion, it's first and foremost teaching and reminding us that God is patient and God is faithful and that he will ultimately judge those who are unwilling to come to him. But there will come a time where he will indeed judge the sins in our own individual lives. You know, we can learn a lot about the Lord and his character from this passage We learn that he's just, we learn that he's patient, we learn that he's compassionate and we can see that he has always desired to protect Israel but only desired that they listen to him. So in that we can see he is eternally faithful to his promises. The Bible is a book that shows us how God deals with his people but then it shows us how he still is dealing with his people today because as he does not change, his character never changes. And it's showing us, I believe, if we look at it in honesty, how God will deal with you and me today also. When we approach and read the Bible today, these ancient scriptures, we shouldn't be just looking to find out something about God. We should be trying to see what we can find out about ourselves and our relationship to him and how we should live our lives. And I think this is a perfect example of a passage that enables us to do this. In this passage, there are all kinds of things that it tells us about God. But it seems to me that also contained within this passage, and don't miss it because there is another deeply, profoundly fundamental truth, one that is intensely practical and it's one that we should apply in our lives, and it is simply this. The reason for the judgment is always because people are unwilling to listen to him. Just like many people today, people still are unwilling to listen to God. But the passage is teaching that God's judgment not only falls upon nations or upon peoples or upon people groups, but it will fall upon anyone who is unwilling, as an individual also, to respond to him. So ultimately it's teaching us that God holds us as individuals responsible 
for our response to him. In other words, responsible for our own choices. If this passage teaches you anything today, I hope it teaches you that you are responsible for yourself and your own relationship with God. And that then must have a wider application in your life at the most practical of levels. I think this passage is actually talking for us today about taking on personal responsibility and accountability before God. It prompted me in the preparation of this study to write down some of the ordinary things in life that I need to remind myself that I'm responsible for. The things I wrote, it's not exhaustive and they're very simple, but the things that struck me to write down where I said, I am responsible for my own life. I am responsible for my own diet. I am responsible for controlling the stewardship I show over this body and the exercise that I take. And moving from the physical, I believe it also, I am wholly responsible for my attitudes, my emotions and what I say to other people. And then I'm responsible for how I spend my time. And then I'm even responsible for the financial stewardship of the money I have. And granted, that is shared along with my wife. When it comes down to it, I can only ultimately be responsible for me. My salvation is personal through a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I can only control me and my own relationship with God. By God's grace, I am responsible totally responsible and need to recognize that totally responsible for everything that makes me me and notice in this passage that the people the very people that jesus was speaking to they weren't willing to do that they weren't willing to be responsible for themselves or for the people they were given responsibility for and that's ultimately why their judgment is coming What really struck me about this passage is the fact that it was given just after Jesus had confronted the religious leadership with the seven woes, these seven accusations he placed on the Pharisees and that the fact that they had been disobedient and that that because they had been given a responsibility, a particular responsibility at that time, not just to obey God in their own lives, but to lead other people. And they had abjectly neglected that responsibility. So now when Jesus comes to the end of this wider discussion, which is the context in which he says what he says here, he says in essence to these guys, you are responsible for what you've done because you Pharisees not only rejected your own response to the gospel, but your responsibility as the leaders of others, which is why he closes the passage by saying, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you were the ones who killed the prophets. I wanted to gather you like little chicks under my wings, but you were not willing. See, now your house is desolate. But what also strikes me about this passage is the uncomfortable truth that the sins of the leaders still remain no excuse for the individual sins of people. For Jesus' call here is to the wider people, the whole town, the whole city, the whole crowd in Jerusalem, perhaps reasonably you might say to the whole nation of Israel, which says, in spite of their leaders, there is still no excuse for our individual sins. You know what this means to me, and what should I believe should mean to all of us on a practical level is, that we can't come and stand before God and say, you know what, I had a bad start in life. You can't even say my parents taught me wrong. Ultimately, you are responsible for making the right decisions or the wrong decisions in your life. These leaders taught the people that Jesus was not the Messiah. They also taught them to put all their emphasis on doing the external things and try and just look good. But they didn't actually have to be good. Yet Jesus, even in this, says, no matter what these leaders taught you, you, O Jerusalem, are still responsible before God for how you live your life and the decisions you make. Because ultimately, my truth is placed at the doorway to the heart of every individual who walks this earth. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, he reported him as saying, he that is willing to do his will shall know his doctrine. Which tells me if you're willing to come to the Bible, come to the Scriptures with an open mind and an open heart towards God, the Holy Spirit will teach you what decisions you need to make. Regardless of how you've been brought up 
or regardless of what you've been taught, you are still personally responsible and equipped to make the right decisions and the simple decisions is you can choose to believe that what this book says is true. You can choose to believe that the character of God and the life of Jesus revealed in this book is indeed that Jesus is in fact the Son of God and that by believing in him, as it tells us, you can have life in his name regardless of what you've been told in the past or even what you've done in the past. If the Bible teaches us anything, it teaches us that we are all individually, personally, before God responsible for ourselves, but that by his grace, we can exercise self-control in our lives and turn our lives over to him. The greatness of this chapter is that it shows us both sides of the coin. It reminds us that no other person, not even our own family or our situation, has the power or the ability to lead you beyond the mercy and forgiveness of God. But it also tells us that God has patience with us when we get it wrong and he has no desire for us to experience his judgment, but we need to respond to that personally and not abuse it. I want to close by telling you a story an illustration from my young life. Many years ago, I had a car, but at that time, I could only drive on what were called L plates in the UK, learner plates, which means I had to have a competent driver over the age of 21 with me in the passenger seat at that time, which usually meant you had to have an adult in the car. Some of my friends had passed their test. They would do it on occasions, but on other occasions, I would, my mother and father would go with me. During that time, I suppose I was really just learning to drive. But one day, with my mum in the passenger seat, while waiting at a junction, waiting for a gap, my mum noticed a small break in the traffic, and she shouted, Go! And in an almost gut reaction and response, I went, being the obedient son, I might say. But unfortunately, I pulled out into the road, right into the way of a coming police car that she hadn't seen coming from the other direction. Now, the police car stopped in time, and the policeman got out of the car, and came up to me and tapped the window for me to roll down the window. We used to roll them down in those days. And he quite simply said to me, you didn't allow enough time for the ongoing traffic. And I just said to him, but my mum said go. I was just doing what my mother said. And the officer said, I don't care who told you when to go. You're the one who chose to go. And you are responsible for what happened next. That is the law of the land. You see, my mum said go, but it was my responsibility. I had a choice and I choose to go. And whatever happened next was my individual responsibility. And by the way, the policeman then turned to my mother and said, just leave him to make his own decisions. He'll learn better that way. He's the one in the driving seat and whatever mistakes he makes will be his mistakes, not yours. You know, friends, we're all responsible before God for the choices we make. But thank God this passage teaches us that he is patient and loving and does not wish any of us to come to harm.